back to Ken Buster Ministries uh, uh, programming. We just thank you for being with us again today, and, and a special thank you to all of our partners that make it possible for us to be on television and shortwave radio around the world. This television show reaches into 195 nations, and so we welcome the nations in uh, to our programming today. We're going to be continuing with Chosen But Not Perfect. This is the teaching of the 12 disciples. Uh, you know, I think every single uh, person in the United States, at least, can name Santa's 12 reindeer at Christmas time. But not even the preachers, not even the ministers or the priests can, can name the 12 disciples. Very few of them. So today, we're going to talk about Philip. Now, Philip is not very well known, um, but we're, we're going to talk about about what we do know about him. Uh, he is the fifth in, in, this, in the series of the disciples. And so the middle group, they're kind of broken into three different groups, the 12. The first three, uh, the first four of the three groups are most known. Peter, Andrew, his brother, James, and then John. Uh, so Peter and John are very well known. And th those... That first group is two sets of brothers. We're going to get into Philip now. These are less known, and it's amazing. Um, the the middle group, Philip, Barth Bartholomew, and Thomas, are only talked about in uh, the book of John. Matthew, uh, you know, is heard from a lot in in the book of Matthew, but this is the middle group, and they're not as well known about it. Uh, since Philip's name is always listed first when it's naming the disciples in this middle group, uh, it seems like he, he was the leader. And uh, so this group was less known, but more known than the last group that we'll get into next week. So let's talk about Philip in the Bible. Uh, the, his name is actually a Greek name. So he was a Jew but he had a Greek name. Now, that is very important. A lot of people may not have understood this, but that is very important, and I'll tell you why. Jews who spoke the Greek language exclusively were called Hellenists. Now, you probably have heard Hellenists in the Bible, especially when you get into Acts 6-1, because it was the Hellenists that were complaining that the widows weren't being ministered to, and so then they uh, chose deacons. Um, they intertwined various systems of beliefs and practices of the people um, who lived under the influence of the ancient Greek culture. And what happened is they... Um, they were so influenced by it that they would try to change. Uh, very, um, very liberal, where they tried to change. Uh, today, they would be called progressive. Okay, that was the way that was done way back then, but we're new. And uh, so this is, uh, this is the way that the Hellenists would work. They did not want to stick to the law and the prophets. They wanted to change things, make it more modern. And um, since Philip was Jewish, he had to ha uh, have a Jewish name. He had to have had a Jewish name. But since the name is never used, it is understood that he came from a Hellenist fa uh, family. And uh, so that's what little we know about him. And different Philips in the Bible, uh, most known Philip in history is Philip of Macedon, who is the father of Alexander the Great. Uh, and so Alexander the Great was responsible for all the languages to be, uh, to, to all the regions around there to only speak Greek, to bring in the Greek language. Um, and the next was Philip the deacon. That's uh, in, in Acts 5 after the Hellenists were complaining and then they chose deacons. Now this was not Philip the apostle. This was Philip the deacon. So that's the second Philip. The third, the third Philip was Philip the tachriarch. Uh, take, take 
And uh, he was the ruler over um, the areas up, up there in the Galilee area. Uh, he was a brother of Herod Antipas. Now, he was a brother of Herod Antipas by his father's, but not by his mother's side. Philip was born of Cleopatra of Jerusalem and Herod of Malthrates, a Samaritan. He died in the 20th year of Tiberius, five years after his mention in Luke 3.1. He built Caesarea Philippi, and that's where uh, the temple of uh, Pan was, and that's where the gates of hell. His stepbrother, Herod Antipas, married his, his wife unlawfully. And so this was the area that this ruler, Philip, uh, had ruled. And this was the area that uh, Philip was raised in, in the Galilee area. Very liberal. And uh, they really believed that Philip, because he went by that uh, Greek name, that he was open to the behavior. He was very liberal and open to the behavior or opinions and willing to discard traditional values of the Jewish people. Um, he actually came from Bethsaida. Now his family lineage, there was a historian named um, Budge, and uh, he said that Philip was from the tribe of Zebulun. Now I've, I've done a lot of study on, on the 12 tribes, and Zebulun had weaknesses. The, the, they had, and you know, when you go to the doctor, the doctor will say, uh, have you had diabetes in your family? Uh, do you have uh, arthritis in your family? Have you had heart problems, high blood pressure? Things like that, because it follows down into the family line. There's a lot of things that follow in the blood uh, through the family lineage, and that is found in, Zeb in, you know, in, the tr in the 12 tribes. You really do see it following in the lineage. Zebulon's family lineage weakness was they were terrible soldiers and they wanted peace at any price. Zebulon's strengths were they were extroverts. They're really outgoing. They support ministries they're, uh, financially. They're gifted writers, they're counselors, and they are reliable. Uh, their symbol is a merchant ship. Now, um, uh, Issachar and Zebulon were very close. Uh, Issachar was studying. He was... He was always studying. He was always uh, discerning the times, and he was, they were always in the tent studying. And uh, Zebulun actually supported Issachar's ministry. So uh, Philip's family may have been swayed by financial uh, influence in that area and uh, gone more to the Greek side. The gospel references... Uh, of, of John references about Philip. Now, all references of Philip are found in the Gospel of John, none other Gospels. His name is mentioned in the other Gospels when it's listing all the 12 disciples, but it seems like he didn't do anything. And when you come to John, all of a sudden John, he was the last writer of the Gospels, and uh, he... Um, didn't write the way the other three wrote, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He didn't write that way. John is totally different. Now, John possibly, uh, you know, he came from a na neighboring town, Capernaum, uh, which was by Bethsaida, and he possibly was a good friend of, of uh, Philip's. Now, I want to read you from uh, John's call when Philip, Philip uh, was called. And it said, uh, I'm reading in the book of John, chapter 1, verse 43. The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, this is the only disciple that's listed that Jesus found. Now, that's a really a clue. Uh, in Hebrew, that means to come after, after searching. Jesus searched out Philip. He was searching for him. He was the first disciple that, he w that was sought out, actually sought out. But, you know, Philip already had a seek seeking heart. Philip was actually wanting uh, to find Jesus. And then when he found Jesus, then he found um, 
in verse 44, and Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter, and he, Peter, uh, verse 45, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now, it, it's believed that um, Nathanael and um, Philip were good friends, very close. And, and so he went and said, come and see, I found him. And when we get to, um, when we get to Nathaniel, you're going to be kind of surprised how that whole thing played out. But he found, God, uh, Jesus found him. You know, um, Peter, Andrew, and John found Jesus, but Jesus found Philip. So that's really kind of special. Another reference here, um, and this is the reading of uh, the, um, the, the, five, uh, the feeding of the 5,000. Now it says 5,000 men, uh, and that's not listing the women and children. So it's believed possibly that uh, there probably may have been up to 20,000 people. Now that's an amazing thing that there was 20,000 people listening to Jesus all day long and hadn't had anything to eat. And here, let me go to um, John 6, 5. Let me find that quick. Let me, let me start with verse 1. After these things, Jesus went over to the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs which he had performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the feast of Passover, the feast of the Jews, was near. And so when the feasts were near, that meant a lot of people were out traveling, and they would travel by family. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing the great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that they may eat? Now, notice, he asked Philip. Now, why would he ask Philip? It is believed that Philip was the, the administrator for Jesus. Now, Judas, we know, what was a, kept a money bag. But there had to be somebody that was in charge of logistics. Where are we going to stay? What are we going to eat? Uh, so an, an administrator is in charge of logistics. Now, um, administrators, I was an administrator uh, at, a, at a, a church for 10 years. Administrator is in charge of following protocol. Uh, protocol comes from two different words. Protos, which means to follow, and column, which means glued together. Now, I'm going to read that from my notes here. Code of conduct which is set forth in writing, revealing one under authority the proper procedures he must follow in order of precedence. In ancient times, protocol was pages glued together in order of the importance on a, a large roll of individual parts, sheet, pages, or sheets. And so they had actually, they would have a protocol and they would keep adding pages, you know, and, and so that, every, that they would be following the same rules all the time. When we come back to John 6, 6, but this he said to test him. To, this was a test. Jesus was saying this to test him. Uh, for he himself knew what he would do. Now, Philip's response right here, Philip's response was 200 denarii. Denarii would be a one day's wage. And he said, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, for every one of them may have a little. Now, he started reasoning it out. He, started, he, he was looking at the people and he said, okay, how, much, how am I going to get enough bread, and how am I going to pay for it? And Jesus said, um, what shall we may eat? And so here we see that Philip was very pessimistic. 
He was very analytical, seeking the impossible situation, overwhelmed by materialistic thinking and common sense calculation. You know, Philip was there when they turned the water into wine, and he had seen Jesus do many miracles. But in this situation, he reverted to his Greek way of thinking, trying to reason everything out, trying to figure it out in a common sense. Jesus was giving him a faith test, and he flunked. He flunked it because Jesus, you know, he could have said, well, Jesus, nothing is too difficult for you. I've seen you turn water into wine. I've seen you do the impossible that nobody else could do. But he did not revert to faith. He did not pass that faith test. He reverted back to natural way of thinking. Um, Peter had an opportunity for the reward of faith, and he failed the test. The Greek mindset is to understand everything. There's a, a, a writing called the Septuagint. And this is after uh, Alexander the Great died and, and the area of Israel went to, to one of his three generals. Now, the, the general was not happy with the Jewish people. He wanted them, everybody to be Greek, and they were following the Hebrew uh, letter. They were following uh, the, the Torah, which is in Hebrew. And so he, to test them, he took 12 scribes from all of the 12 disciples, which would be 72. And he put them in caves, separated them, and put them in different caves and uh, different places to write. And he said, if you don't all do the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, if I want these all from Hebrew to Greek. And if you don't agree, if, if all of you don't agree with the same thing, all 72, that uh, the, you will no longer be able to use the Hebrew. And so they, they turned it from the Hebrew to the Greek. The miracle was that, on, on that uh, at the end of that, that period that they gave them, I can't remember how many days it was that they gave them in, at, for that project, but when it came back to every single one of the 72 scribes, actually were in total agreement in the writing into Greek. It was a miracle. But you know what happened in, in the heavenlies? It turned dark for three days and three nights. Three days and three nights, there was no light. You know why? The rabbis say that, that the Lord was grie grieving because they, the Hebrew people treated the word of God with reverence and holy and they with trust and now it was going to be turned into the greek understanding where they had to try to figure out god they just had to understand it in the natural mindset and that's not what god intended and and that really is what the subtuagent is but peter was learning to lay aside his human reasoning and uh and go to faith have a supernatural walk of faith so let's look here when he comes further on, John's recording more, and John 12, 20 through 22. Now, there were certain Greeks. Now, there again, Greeks don't always mix with, with the, the Jewish people very seldom. So it was so incredibly unusual to, to, for Jesus to pick a disciple that really maybe was Jewish in blood, but everything else about him was Greek. Now, there were gr certain Greeks among those who came to worship at the feast. They came to Philip because of his Greek name and his, and his family, who had, uh, was from Bethsaida of Galilee and said, asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. But Jesus said to them, the hour is not yet come, the Son of Man shall be glorified. Now really what he was saying is, it, that is not the right protocol. The right protocol is, Jesus was supposed to go to the Jews first. Okay? Now why did, uh, why did the Greeks pick uh, Philip? 
because Philip was a, um, he had a Greek name. His, his family was more under the Hellenistic influence of, of the Greek way of doing things. Um, but in Matthew 10, 5 through 6, Jesus said, do not go the way of the Gentiles. And in Matthew 15, 24, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus' priority was always to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. He, it was out of order. It, he had to do things the, the way that, um, you know, that his father told him to do it. Now, why did Philip go to Andrew to bring him to Jesus? Because Philip didn't bring people to Jesus. Andrew was a great soul winner, and he would bring people individually. If you remember, uh, Jesus taught, uh, talked to Peter and Andrew when they were fishing and said, I will make you fishers of men. Now, Peter caught multitudes at one time. He was a great fisherman and, and a fish, but he said, you're going to catch and, and his first time he preached, he had 3,000 religious Jews saved. Now, Andrew wasn't the same way. He didn't catch them in big nets. He caught them one by one. He was a personal soul winner. And um, here we go to, the next one we're going to go to is um, when Jesus was, when he, they were in the upper room, and that's in 14. 8 through 11. And Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. And Jesus said, Have I been with you so long, yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has not known me has seen me, has, he who has seen me has seen the Father. And how can you say, Show us the Father? And verse 10, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak in my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Now, he was saying, believe in me. If you don't believe in me that, uh, that I've, I'm in the Father, just believe for the work's sake. And, and he was saying, no matter what, just believe. Just believe, Philip. And he was trying to get him shifted again back from that Greek way of thinking. His, 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 that's, his greatest, uh, that his, that's his greatest downfall, is he had so much human reasoning. And that was his upbringing. Um, now, Philip, Philip's ministry is very interesting. Um, Philip's ministry was in Heropolis. Now, Heropolis was an area... Uh, it remains a Turkish city, and it's kind of in the heart of Ephesus and Colos uh, Col uh, the, the, uh, Smyrna and Tyrathyra. He's kind of in the midst of all of the seven churches over there. But this was a city. This is not a church. This was a city. And uh, this was a Greek city. This was very much a Greek, uh, a place where all the Greeks would come. And he went to that, um, that place. Let's see. It is noted that Heropolis received no letter from Paul or John, whereas the neighboring cities of Colossae and Laodicea received letters. Perhaps this has become Heropolis was P Philip's fief or fife. I don't know exactly how to say that. But what that means is that that was his territory. That was underneath his control. So all of the letters, you know, the, like the book of Ephesians, that went to all the churches, but it didn't go to this one because that was a place, that was his assignment. Um, there was a great health spa there. there was, this was a place where people would, would come to, uh, to have healing. Uh, it's a former health resort where Philip's tomb is still to be found. A great chem chemically impregnated spring of lukewarm water still sparkles 
from the rocks and forms an enormous crystallized falls over the side of the mountain, much like Niagara Falls. And so here you see on the side of the mountain here, it's, it's real white and it's, it's from the, the, um, the water that would come down there. And many people came there for healing. He, uh, he was also associated with France, so somehow he had gone somewhere up into France. Um, the Archbishop of Seville called Philip undoubtedly the greatest man of his time in the Church of Spain. Afterwards, he was stoned and crucified and died in Hierapolis, the, um, the city of uh, Phrygia having been buried with a corpse upright alone in, with his daughters rest there. Now his daughters, he had daughters that were prof prophetess and they were buried there with him. Philip the martyr, here's another one that the other one said he was stoned, look at here. This one said he was stoned and crucified. Now this is a different way of looking at it. It says the Acts of Philip is an actual book uh, tells how Fi Philip and Bartholomew peached in Hierapolis and how Philip was martyred and pierced through the thighs and hung upside down. Bartholomew, however, escaped. And so this is the story of Philip the martyr, Philip the apostle. He would, if you remember, he had a Greek name, he was Jewish, but he had a Greek name, so his downfall was human reasoning. And we, we don't want you to be involved in human reasoning. We want you to walk by faith. Jesus wants you to walk by faith. And Philip learned how to walk by faith. And he was sent to teach all the Greeks with all their human reasoning and thinking to walk by faith. So if there's one thing I can leave you with today is walk by faith and not by sight. Have a great day.